Derech mitzvah secha, iser sinas yisrael, mitzvah avas yisrael. The prohibition to hate another Jew and the mitzvah to love another Jew. Last time we saw what it says in the Sefer HaChinuch in regard to both of these mitzvahs. One, to not hate your brother, and it quotes other verse, you shouldn't hate your brother in your heart. Why does it say hating in the heart? Because that's the lowest level of hatred. That's something that's being harbored, festered in the heart, and that eventually then will lead to all sort of ills towards somebody else. The Torah cuts it off and just says, don't even hate your brother in your heart. You know what if he just knows he's my enemy and we just have behaviors toward each other that are just unsavory behaviors? Then there's other prohibitions that come in there. I don't remember the exact context of it, but when I was teaching in the high school, and it, I don't remember why it came up, but it's something to the effect of, do you think if I ever have to tell you guys off or something, like, do you think I'm angry when I do that? Either if I have to raise my voice or be stricter or firmer without actually feeling anger in that moment, I could cut the emotion off of the expression. You see that also sometimes where it talks about, it says, Ve'yichar af Hashem. We translate as God became angry, but literally means that his nostrils flared, which isn't actually saying that God is angry. It's just showing an external expression of anger, which does not necessarily mean that there's anger in side with it. So just show that there's a differentiation. Here, the law of the Torah is that you shouldn't hate your brother in your heart. Okay, so I won't hate him in my heart. I'll just have these behaviors toward him that are not great behaviors. No, there's other prohibitions that are transgressed with that. And one of them is the next mitzvah that's in the Mimer is the mitzvah of Abbas Yisrael to love your fellow, which is actually interesting because it says don't hate your brother in your heart. And then here it says you have to love your fellow down to your soul. I don't know if this is a reason, but I would assume that the soul being a divine entity, or especially talking about your divine soul, your divine soul wouldn't be able to harbor hatred toward another soul. So here it says you have to love your brother in your heart. And then also all the good behaviors will follow from there. As in, you'll treat him well, you'll praise him, you will not try to elevate yourself through his disgrace, you'll take care of his money, his wife, things that are important to him, etc. So Sefer HaChinuch covers that. But the next thing that we saw is from the Gemara where it talks about the person who wanted to convert and came to Hill says, teach me the whole Torah on one foot. What does Hill say? Hill says, what is hateful to you, don't do to somebody else. That's the whole Torah, everything else is commentary, go learn it. We gotta make sure you go study it. The phrasing is interesting. It doesn't say love somebody else. It says, what's hateful to you, don't do to somebody else. And then we ask the question, an integral question of the Mimer is that, yes, I can understand how behaviors between me and somebody else, what we call Ben Adam Machavero. I can see how all the mitzvahs that have to do with interpersonal relationships, society, and things like that can all be predicated upon what's hateful for you don't do somebody else that seems like a good basis for all sort of laws and rules within society what does that have to do with the mitzvahs between what we call ben adam makam between man and god davening kosher or anything else that doesn't specifically affect somebody else how are those all encompassed in saying what is hateful for you don't do unto somebody else so i'm going to, have to start laying the groundwork for where we're eventually going to get to be able to reveal the secrets and answer this question of how everything is wrapped up within this we saw also the whole idea of the mitzvah between man and god it all comes essentially to accepting the yoke of heaven there's a level where it doesn't necessarily mean anything to god in the sense that what happens in the physical world he's so far removed from it where does this all fit in here we spoke about how we are seeing that the bits of obviously soul is so integral that even before we start davening i take upon myself the mitzvah of loving fellows myself and not just that but in the pre time which kabbalistic work it says that through this a person will have success in their prayer this is necessary for this to take this upon themselves then we saw also that the arizal even though he was a great tzaddik still would say vidu the confession because he wasn't necessarily saying it for himself he was saying it for for other people what do you mean he was saying it for other people? Because that led us to this idea that we're going to be building upon much more, that we're all part of one entity. We are all part of what we call an Shama Klalas, an all-encompassing, all-inclusive soul. And that soul is a soul of Adam, Adam Arishon, the first man. And we are just extensions of different parts of the limbs. The souls that we have just are extending from different parts of the limb of this all-inclusive man. The reason I'm saying the view, the confession, is not specifically for him, but for the other parts of the soul, for other parts of the body, the entity that may need it, because we are responsible for each other to an extent. And that brought us to where we are now, which actually continues on this idea of us being all part of the same body and where each soul is drawn down from some limb of this full entity. That brings us to the Medrash Tan Choma. It's speaking about here when the Mishkan was built and Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, see I have called by name Betzalo. Betzalo is the name of the person who built the Mishkan. Betzalo bin Ori Berchor. So Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, see I have called my name Betzalo. Shlomo Melech said, what was, its name was already called and it is known that he is a man. This is a quote from Kohelas. Scripture also says elsewhere in reference to this who worked and did, who caused the generations from the beginning. The Holy One blessed me, he declared, when I determined at the very beginning of time to build the Mishkan, I already announced his name and is known that he is a man. As in, we're saying that I've already called by name Betzalel. So Hashem is saying that from the outset, I designate that Betzalel will be the one to design the Mishkan along with parentheses, along with Ali of Ben Achisamach from Dun. So you have Yehudan, the tribe from Yehudan, Dun. More exalted tribe, less exalted tribe. Very cumulative. We have encompassed everyone in the building of the Mishkan. Even when the first man was 
was a lifeless mass. The Holy One, blessed be he, showed him all the righteous men who would descend from him. Some hung from his head, others were suspended from his hair, and still others from his neck. His two eyes, his nose, his mouth, his ears, and his arms. This is part of the text that supports this idea that we're all part of the same entity. Proof of this is in the fact that when Eve, as in Job, wanted to argue with his creator and said, would that I knew and I would find him, I would come to the place prepared for him, I would set out my case before him, and I would fill my mouth with arguments, I would know the words that he would answer me, and I would understand what he would say to me. A few verses from Eve that are being quoted here. The Holy One blessed be he replied to him, where were you when I founded the earth? Tell if you know understanding. Eva hayisak biyas the arts. Rabbi Shimon, the son of Lakish ben Cain, where were you is written because he said to him, where were you suspended from the first man? Was it from his head, his hair, his neck, his eyes, or from one of his limbs? Wonderful description. This commentary from Major Shalom Chum is brought in to substantiate the idea of how we are all part of the one entity of the first man. Thus, this first man, he was called Adam, from the language of Adam el Elyon, an all-encompassing soul from Adam de la Adam de la which is higher man. Adam de la comprised of the ten spheres on a level known as parts of face. As the son resembles his father, Adam, and thus the Jewish people resemble Adam de la the sublime man. To say, first of all, where do we get Adam el Elyon? This is a verse from Yeshaya, from Isaiah. Allah al Bamasi of Adam el Elyon. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will like myself to the Most High. I will be like the one above. And from Parsha Shmos, and shall say to Pharaoh, so said Hashem, your firstborn son is Israel. So let's bring in two more elements here. We are all part of the one man, the Neshama Klaus, this all-encompassing soul. The name of Adam, where does it come from? This language of Adam el Elyon, I'll be like the one above. What do you mean I'll be like the one above? God says about the Jewish people, B'ni B'chor Yisrael, my firstborn son, the Jewish people. When we say that man is made in God's image, and we said what we're talking about is that we have a similar configuration of the attributes. There are the 10 attributes through which God interacts with the world, and we also have those attributes within us. And what it's saying is that the same way that a son resembles his father. So, so child to parent, this is a similar thing, that Adam, Adam le'el, I'd be like the one above, because as a son resembles his father, so Adam, the configuration, the makeup of Adam resembles this configuration. Where we have the language of like a face from last time, that we had Zer Anpin, the small face, because the face is made up of different organs. So that's different attributes making up this entity. Going further with this, this is from what's called Shnei L'chod Abrit, which is from a great rabbi called the Shalom. And he called their name Adam. So this is talking about when Adam was created, and God says, he'll be known as Adam, as in man. This is an explanation of the generations of man, and the end is that if he is attached above and resembles Hashem to walk in his ways, his name is called Adam from the language of, I will be like the one above, Adam el Elyon. And on the throne was the likeness of a man. When man, as in when Adam, will be godlike in his behavior, as in doing what he's supposed to be doing, then his name is like, oh, this comes from Adam el Elyon, I'll be like the one above. Also where it says there, on the throne was the likeness of a man, this is in reference to the chariot of Yechesko. Remember the chariot of Ezekiel? We saw it in the Micha Mochamim, with the face of an ox and the face of a lion and the eagle and the man and this is the spiritual source of the world of Yitzhira for everything that's in this world. So also there's likeness of a man sitting on the throne. When we are like above this name is a name of elevation for us. It's a name of praise for us. And if he separates himself from this attachment then he's called Adam after the name of Adama Adama, the earth from which he's taken and thus he is and to dust it shall return. So if he is not like the one above, if you are not behaving as you should, then it's like oh you're just like the earth from which you came from. You are dust and nothingness. So then it's like a name not of elevation. Indeed the name Adam which shows I'll be like the one above as in when we use it in the language of Adam el Elyon is the main purpose. This is the point of everything to be like the one above because evil is not created only for the sake of good as I've explained. Therefore, the name Adam itself numerically adds up to the great name Havaya with Milo Aleph, the name of Ma, which is 45. We saw this in the last mimer. The name of Havaya, the Yud, and then the He, and then the Vav, and the He, and there's different ways of spelling it out, and that equals different numerical computations, different numerical values. The name of Ma, Ma means what without ego. What is this? It's the potential for anything to be. Remember, so also that's part of the potential of anything can change in this world. When it says Milo Aleph, as when you spell out the letters with an Aleph. So for example, hey isn't spelled as a letter hey, or with a hey and a yud, or a hey and a hey is spelled with a hey and an Aleph. So you have yud, and then the hey is spelled with an Aleph. Vav is also spelled with an Aleph, and hey is also spelled with an Aleph. You add it all up, you get to 45. Adam de Ela, the name of Adam, Aleph is one, Dalit is four, Mem is 40. What do you get? 45. Man following and doing as he should, this, this is indicative of him being at this level, the 45 and the 45, the two numerical values, that Adam is at this level like Ma is. Why is this so important? Because what is part of this whole thing of Ma? The whole thing with the name of Ma, as we saw even from last time, this is the name through which we draw down to the world and we effectuate with this world. This is the name that draws down the potential for change and things to happen in this world. There's an idea that we've also spoken about this before. There are different worlds. We had the world before our world, which is the world of Tohu, that they say is the world of chaos, and then our world, which is the world of Tikkun, order and fixing of stuff. 
The world of Tohu, if you remember, we talked about it, how it's a world of great energies. It's a world where the light is too bright to be contained. The vessels that are supposed to hold it, they broke. It's the world where everything is too strong a frenetic energy, so it can't interrelate. So imagine if you're working in a group, everybody's a very strong personality and they can't work together because they're such strong, assertive entities. There's no cross integration. That was not a sustainable world. So in that world, all the sparks broke and can shatter down to this world. The next world to come was a world of dimmer light. So it's like taking less strong personalities, but then they could actually work together. So the way they describe when you talk about the different attributes coming into play in the world of Tohu, they're separate entities like one under the other. You can't have the kind of chart that we've gotten used to seeing where there's a cross integration that each one can speak to each other. That could only happen in the world of Tikkun. It ends up as the three columns and their interrelated attributes. You could have kindness within strength, strength within kindness, harmony of kindness, harmony and strength, etc. Kind of like when we count the Omer. In this world of Tikkun where it's not as bright of a light, this is a world where these attributes can interrelate with each other. Even though they're each their entity, but now they can speak to each other. And then together, like a face with separate organs, but they all make up one entity. This integration, as in the fact that they can all talk to each other, this integration results from drawing down the name Ma from the forehead, the Insof. So you're drawing it down all the way from the top. Insof is in the infinite light, the light without end, to include the entire Shalshalus, the chain of creation, and individual beings. It's specifically this name of Ma, of what? The potential of the 45, the name that's related to the name of Adam. This aspect of the name that's being drawn down is the aspect that allows for things to talk to each other. So you gotta have different entities connected and talking to each other. This is from Divriyam. Divriyam is a uh, chronicles. Divriyam 1. Bechim Yani. Now who am I and who are my people that we should gather up strength to do it like this? For all is from you. And from your hand we have given it to you. All is from you that all is coming from this name of Ma that allows for this. Although each sphere is distinct, every attribute is its own entity, even opposite of others, as in you think of kindness is the givingness, strength is withholding, so these seem to be opposite each other, they can interrelate through influence from Hashem's infinite name of the dimension of Ma, which connects the different attributes like a path connects two separate places. The same way, two totally different things, seemingly two totally different things, they can be brought together by one path. This name of Ma is what allows things that seem to be totally different, totally opposite each other, to be brought together. This brings us to something that is from Tikkun Ezor. It actually was referenced in the last Mimer, and we saw one part of it. I only pulled one or two paragraphs from it, and this one put the whole thing here with an explanation of what's going on. <laughs> so that's why this is going to be many, many pages. This is actually also something that is said in the Mincha of Friday afternoon. It's added in, and it's Pasach Aliyo, as in Elijah the prophet, opened and said. And this, we have a whole description of things that are going on here with these attributes. Eliyahu Anavi, Elijah the prophet, revealed this. And it says that he was speaking to Rabbi Shem Bar Yochai the Rashbi. He was the one who had to hide in the cave. And then he wrote the Zohar. This chart that we keep seeing with all these attributes, a lot of what we know about it is here in the Pasach Eliyahu. Even though a small reference is made about the name of Ma, in the Mimer, but he ended up putting the whole thing in so you could actually see, oh, this is where they get it from. So Eliyahu Anavi, Elijah the prophet, stood before Rabbi Shem Bar Yochai, his holy circle of colleagues and all the great souls in the Supernal Garden of Eden, and spoke this praise to the Master of all worlds, thus revealing many hidden matters. The prophet Elio opened and said, Eternal hidden master of the world, you are he whose unity is infinite and absolute, and therefore indivisible. When we talk about God in his essence, whatever that's supposed to mean, but it's a singular, whole, simple entity. There's not multiple parts there. There's no variation or difference. Everything is just a wholeness, a simple, plain wholeness. It's only once the idea of creation is coming about that there seems to then be other things coming out of it. That then we have differentiation. When you're in the essence, everything is just simple wholeness which is also part of the idea of why we don't have so much godly revelation and the idea of moving away from that because if not we'd all just be subsumed we'd all just go back to the wholeness so it's only when there's quote unquote what seems to be a moving away from it that we could actually start having what appear to be separate entities you are he the first cause transcendent beyond all that is above and concealed beyond all that is concealed no thought whatsoever can grasp you and where did I get this I think I got this translation from Chabad.org and then like there was an explanation there also so I mushed together a few different things here master of infinite realities you are singular perfectly simple you cannot be included in any set there is no number two to your number one. You are not numbered among anything else at all, for there is truly nothing outside of your oneness. You are not only relatively higher as the spiritual is higher than the physical, you are entirely beyond your creations and emanations. You are concealed, but not as other things are concealed. You are essentially unknowable. Even the first intellect that emanates from you cannot fathom its own origin within you. We can't fathom it. We try to use terminologies that would sort of help us to understand him, him capital H, but we can't. It's actually interesting because Derek Metzosecha also has, it's like a whole book worth. The mimer is a very long mimer. Mitzvah which is the mitzvah of belief in God, and it goes through it. It discusses in detail all these things about if there could be a creation from him, how does he relate to things, is this part of him, it's not part of him, what functionings is he using, and it, it breaks it all down in detail to say all the language that we use and all the discussion that we have creation, none of it negates the fact that God is a simple whole entity. There's not anything that's existing outside of him, yet somehow all these emanations are coming from him. So Eliana discusses God's imminence as he invests his presence within the spheres. The spheres are compared to adornments, not just ordinary clothes, but clothes that enhance the beauty of the wearer. Clothes conceal but allow a person to present himself to others. Fine ornaments and jewelry bring out quality 
qualities that would otherwise not be perceived. The ten sphere reveal him through the concealment of him. Remember, we spoke about this also last time, the whole idea of the world of Gvura versus the world of Chesed. The world of Chesed is the world in flux, but the world of Gvura is Olam Barri, so that you saw a clear world, because their things have a definition. You could have a greater godly revelation, you could have greater experience of godliness, only because we were able to contain it somehow for you to be able to experience it. Here it's using this idea that the sphere, says in these ten attributes, they give us a type of packaging of God through a certain sort of attribute. This is God through kindness. This is God through strength. This is God through harmony, etc, etc, etc. Because otherwise, there's no way of relating to him. You already brought forth ten rectifications. We call them the ten sphere of Atsilas, with which to regulate the powerful illumination of your light that flows down through hidden worlds that are not revealed, the worlds of Adam Kadbon and Atsilas, as well as worlds that are revealed, Buria, Yitzira, Asiya. You are he that emanate ten spheres which frame particular qualities, concealing the whole to reveal the essence. They are not an essential aspect of you, but the interface between your creation. So interface is a word that people like to use a lot. It's just how God relates to us. For you create an endless number of realities, some that do not perceive themselves as separate from you, and others that perceive only their own reality. We always talk about these four worlds, but of course there's way more than only four. It's just these are like four main dimensions, four main entities. Indeed it's through these, the ten spirit of each universe, that you are hidden from human beings so they can exist and not be overwhelmed by your light. Elio is revealing all this. You are he who binds them, the spheres together, and unifies them to yourself. And inasmuch as you are within them, anyone who separates one from the other is regarded as having caused a separation in you and your absolute unity. These are all somehow a part of you, but they do not actually define your essence, you with a capital Y. You filter your light through these worlds so that self-cognizant beings may stand within the power of your light while retaining their sense of existence. Remember, if not, would just be subsumed in the oneness wholeness, we can't exist as separate entities. You bond these spheres together as a single whole, just as a life within a body unites the many cells and organs into a single person. We're going to see more description about this, the idea how the soul is one powering entity that also, not only just being the light switch of the body, also gives powers to each. But somehow it all just goes back into the one essence of the soul. It's not like you can look in the soul and you say, oh, here I see the power of sight. It's only once it comes out into the eyes that it manifests then as the power of sight. It's a similar system of the way God's working. These are just tools, they're godly tools through which God interacts with us. You bond these spheres together as a single whole, just as life within a body unites the many cells and organs into a single person. And since you are the sustaining force of the unity, if any person should cause a division among this, the sphere through destructive actions in his world below, remember we saw that if a person transgresses, they wreck the spiritual ecological system. It is as though he has caused a division in your oneness, for he prevents your light from emanating throughout the spirit and thereby throughout the world. It prevents the divine energy from coming down to this world, which is why we have to process the process correctly for full rectification, to put everything back in order the way it's supposed to be. The spheres fuse with the light that emanates through them, thereby also fusing with one another. In this way, the spheres are to these emanations much more than lenses are to light. Light is changed by the lens through which it flows, but the lens itself is not changed by the light flowing through it. Light could come in through different kinds of lenses, windows, etc., but it's the same light. It just seems to be different according to whatever tool, whatever medium is taking it through, but the light itself is unchanged. The spirit, on the other hand, actually fused with light within them as well as with the source of that light. In this way, the relationship of the spirit and the light is similar to the way the body and the soul fuse to become a single person. Yet the bond is even greater than that for the light and the sphere extend from one source so they can unite in perfect harmony. This idea is crucial. If the spheres were external devices that force the infinite light into focus, then the act of creating and sustaining the world would pose an actual limitation for God and for his light. God's light would be affected by the act of creation and the world would be outside of him. However, the spheres are no more than the infinite choosing to express himself in these ten ways. For him, no real change has occurred. In this way, a world is created in which God is always accessible as it's a godly world at its essence. Do you remember, we saw this in Tanya. It said, Ania vaya lo shenisi, I got have not changed. So even though God created the entire world, there was no change that happened within him. Just to understand what sort of power and entity we're speaking of, God could create an entire world and it's not anything for him. There's no change that happened with God. So you're saying, but what happened with all these attributes that he created to interact with us? These are not changes for God. These are just tools that are there for his light to be going through. But the light is an unchanged light, which also sets up that God should be accessible because it is a godly world. By the way, you see the way that all this description is, when you hear somebody be like, oh, do I believe in God? Do I believe in this old man in the sky? You can see how pithy, how tiny a descriptor that is when you're talking about God. This is such an in-depth, I guess you say revelation, such an in-depth descriptor of what's going on in the world and it's so far beyond. When people are talking in that kind of manner, it's so tiny what they're thinking of. How can you fathom what Jewish thinkers and philosophers and sages have been discussing for centuries and the depth? So small to speak in that kind of way. These ten spheres are arranged in a special order of three columns. The right column is called long because it represents your love and kindness. The right side we know is the side of love, it's the side of chesed. The left column is short, quote unquote, because it represents your judgment and power of restraint and withdrawal, this side of gvura, side of fear. The middle column is intermediate, in between, because it represents your mercy, the perfect harmony of love and restraint. So you see how this descriptor is used. Kindness is longer than what withdrawal would be. Say withdrawal, but withholding. These spheres begin as one, but emerge in three columns. So you have the one power that's coming through, and we saw the whole thing with Atik and Arach, etc. And then now they're going to start branching out into these different attributes. The right of wisdom, kindness, and victory is talking about Chachma, Chesed, and Netzach. The left, understanding might and glory, lender, acknowledgement, as in Bina, Gvura, and Hod, through which you deal with the world's in strict judgment, and the middle column of knowing beauty and royalty, which is Das, Teferis, royalty as in Malchus, what we usually say as kingship. 
he's using the word royalty here, through which you deal with the world with compassion and forgiveness. So we see, yes, we recognize all these attributes. We recognize that this is how God deals with us. We even saw these are the building blocks and the tools of creation. The spheres are not discussed as individual entities, but in terms of the relationship with one another, with the light they contain. Nothing exists as an entity of its own. This also goes to the idea about the fact that there's interrelation. In this way, the ten spheres are conduits through which you regulate your interaction with human beings according to their deed. Above all, it is you alone who directs them. There is no power that directs you, neither above nor below nor from any direction. The ten spheres of Atils are one entire system or body, and you are the soul that fills it and directs it. Just as the human body disguises the intensity of the soul, the spirits serve to disguise and conceal your light. So the body is this external entity that's functioning, but it's being powered by the soul. Remember we saw this also in Kalm Rach What's the difference between a body that's alive and a body that's not alive? What's the difference? One has an on switch on. One has a soul in it that's giving it life that makes everything within the body happen. But we don't see that because the body, you could even say it is the interface for the soul. So here the same way, these attributes work like that for God's divine light. All these attributes are only by your will and nothing restricts you to follow this order other than your own decision. God is not compelled for it to work this way. God created the system, but he's not compelled for this to be the system. Just the system that God chose. Nothing from the higher spirit of intellect nor from the lower sphere of royalty or kingship and neither from the middle six spheres that generate the six directions. So none of these attributes compel God to behave in any sort of way. God is the one powering and steering them through the choice that he decided this is how it's going to work. So until here, Eliel has spoken only about the highest world of Attilas, which is the starting point of all of this. Now he discusses how the spheres of this world relate to the three lower worlds, because there's four main worlds, which comprise the actual creation. So we get down to us creation. Attilas is like the creator in a modality of creating, as in this is him starting to get the tools out. But the three lower worlds are that which he creates. The spheres provide the interface to lower creator worlds, but they remain entirely otherworldly. The author ever uses the metaphor of sunlight. The sun itself is not light. Remember, we actually saw the passage for this. The sun itself is not light. It generates light and light radiates from it, but it itself is not luminance, but a luminary. What we call what comes out of the sun, we're like, oh, this is light. This is sunlight. But if you would go into the sun, you'd be like, but where's the light? You don't say that. Everything is just sun. There's not a separate thing called light in the sun. It's just what we call whatever comes out of the sun. We're like, oh, we need a name for it. Okay, we'll call it light. So is there light within the luminary? Yes and no. Yes, because to us on earth, the sun is light. No, because as far as the sun is concerned, it is a luminary and there's no distinct entity of light within the luminary. The sun itself is a luminary. It is put there. It was put in the sky to give us light here on earth. The fact that we call it light, just we need a name for it when it hits us. If you talk to the sun itself, he's like, no, I don't have a thing called light. I'm just sun. I'm sun and I, and I give off sun. Yes, funny you should say that. We have a name for it. We call it light. In context of its seals, the ten spheres are not distinct entities, but completely absorbed and united with their source, the infinite light, only to the garments as in the created world below that come from it do they appear as distinct spheres. So we're talking about the first world of its seals where creation, there's some idea that comes about, even though it's still too closely related for us to call it actual creation. It's a similar kind of thing. So look, we are identifying these different attributes, but in that world, it's not like that. The world doesn't see itself in that kind of distinct terminology. This leads to another metaphor. The spheres are called bodies and the worlds created through them are called clothing. We feel that we are non-physical beings within physical bodies. The body is not something separate, but it does not define us. Your soul is who you really are. Your body is just the vehicle that the soul operates through. You have to treat it well, but it's not the real you. Is the real you your face? Is the real you is your hand, your hair, whatever? What is the real you? The real you is this you that doesn't even have a name to it. It's the soul you. Our clothing, on the other hand, is entirely external to us. It can be removed or switched at any time. So the spirit do not define God, yet they are not entities entirely separate from him. There are ways through which he is manifest. The world, on the other hand, are creation, sustained every moment by the will of the creator, but are not him. So we see that they're making distinctions here, especially to say that God has not changed. How does God operate within things? What are these tools, etc.? So yes, these are all things that God has created and manifested, and this is the decision he made for it to be like this. He's not compelled for it to be this way. But despite the fact that everything has come from him, we can't say that this is actually him. In a sense, it's a part of him, but it's not actually him, because the actual him, the essence of him, capital H, is something that we can't even fathom it, let alone try to define it. You also arrange a system of three lower worlds, Briatia and Asia, that serve as garments to further cover over the spirit of its seals and protect us from the intensity of your light. It's from these garments that the soul, the neshama, ruach, and nefesh of human beings originate. So you invested these ten spheres within three layers of worlds, much as a body and clothing, the world of creation, the world of formation, and our world, the world of actualization, or action they call it. Descending through these three worlds, the soul is able to invest itself within a human body. If you remember we spoke about originally how God had to create a vacuum and then there was a kava light that came through, part of that whole description is that there's something called the Rashim of the impression. The trace was left. We don't understand how much God's light had to be dimmed per se, contracted, for us to be able to come about. Because this is our entire existence and already it's unfathomable. But our existence is just from some concentrated beam of light, which is such a fraction. You can't even use such terminology to say it's a fraction of God's powers and capacities. And it has to be that way or else we can't exist. Because again, we don't just be back in the one is. The spheres of its seals are closed within these garments and for this reason, they're called limbs of a body relative to the clothes that cover over them. These limbs are arranged as follows. Remember we said that all the attributes are like a person. Chesed, or loving kindness is the right arm. Gvura, restraint, is the left arm. And Tiferous harmony is the torso. And the Alan is describing to us how it actually aligns with the human form. The spheres themselves are bodies, and as well, you first gave each sphere three layers of interface between them and these worlds, those layers being the names or containers, the tailor by which the spheres are called. But they are entirely unworldly and are only called bodies once there are garments that cover over them. 
meaning that they are only called spheres as in an attribute from the perspective of the world below them. In their own plane, they're more like garments covering the more transcendent soul like lights of its hills. Chesed, kindness and love is a positive flow, eventually manifests as the right arm of the human form. Gvur, which is might and awe, which is a withholding of that flow, becomes manifest as the left arm. We've seen this so many times. Chesed, giving, spreading out, water, gvura, withholding, strength. Who is someone who's truly strong? Someone who can control themselves to withhold the potential, damning the potential, fire, because manifest as the left arm. Tver's beauty and truth, a harmony between opposites, manifests as the torso. Netzach, here it says dominance. You can see it as endurance, victory. Part of why I left these translations is so you could see how there's different ways that they're translated because there's different parts to these uh, attributes. Hod, empathy, or acknowledging, splendor, humility, these are all attached to this, are the two legs. And Yisod, foundation or channel, is the body's extremity, the sign of the Holy Covenant, as in where the bris is, reproduction. Machos kingship is the mouth of the Holy Covenant, is therefore called the oral Torah. Mouth, because that expresses to somebody else, that goes outside the self. That's why man is called a madaber, one who speaks. A king can only be a king if there's someone else to be a king over. So again, that's what mouth, because we speak for other people to hear. Netzach and Hod are subspheres that bring kindness and might toward action, manifest as the two legs. Yisai foundation, whereby all flow of the infinite light is channeled toward the worlds, is the final extension of the human form. Because the whole idea of foundation, of reproduction, is taking all of it and then now we're going to give it over. And here's where the Brit Mila is performed. Malchus, royalty, dominion, and actualization, kingship, becomes the human power of speech. In its most essential form, it descends as the teachings that we generate through our learning of Torah. So having discussed the spheres that correspond to the lower external body, we now move upward to the higher inner faculties. So now we're going to the intellectual faculties. Chachma is translated as wisdom, but elsewhere the Zohar breaks the word into two parts. Koach ma. Koach means the potential, the power of what? Ma is what? The power of what? The potential for what? Referring to that which cannot be known. There's no sense of ego or self. It's just possibility. It's the power of possibility. A potential. Chachma is a potential insight into the unknowable. Chachma is the first and most subtle containment for the infinite light. Everything starts from Chachma. Because it does not distort it in any way. Because there's no ego, sense of self, whatever. Because it is nullified, what we call bittel, totally give it over. That's why it can totally just transfer it down. It doesn't personalize it the way that our own minds would personalize information. It simply sees that which cannot be known and provides being the potential for some insight that is graspable. Chachma takes this possibility, the potential for knowledge, and gives it over to Bina. Here, do something with this. Bina is translated as understanding. Bina attempts to grasp the light, integrate it so that it can be knowable in some form. That's the mind trying to understand something, to digest it, figure it out. To do this, it must remain always faithful to Chachma. The two are called true friends that never part. They need each other. It is most successful when it feels the quintessence of that which Chachma is providing it. And in this way, brings it more light into Chachma. Through this process, Bina gives birth to emotions, i.e. the lower sphere. Above these limbs is the head, as in above the limbs of the body, we have the head. Chachma, wisdom is the right brain, the seat of thought, and being understanding is the left brain, and the heart, which is the heart's ability to discern, showing understanding. Concerning these, it is written, the hidden things belong to God, corresponding to Chachma, our God corresponding to Bina. And as stars flash em elokeinu, as in that which can't be known is to God, but when we say elokeinu, my God, that means I've personalized it. I made it something that I could know. Chachma, wisdom is the dominant power of the mind, residing in the right orb of the brain, the seat of creative thought. Bina, which is understanding, manifests in the left orb of the brain, but its effects are more apparent in the heart, because the whole point of knowing is to elicit. Both of which allow for intuitive understanding to bring wisdom to fruition. Something is supposed to come out of this entire intellectual process. These two remain beyond the world as hinted to in this verse, which means the two spheres which remain hidden in the act of creation are wisdom, where the name of Vai is manifest, and understanding, where the name of Elohim is manifest. The world was created through the emergence of the seven lower spheres in the seven days of creation. Remember, Atik Yomun is removed from the days. When he removed from the days, removed from the attributes through which creation comes about, the tools of creation. These higher spheres transcend creation are only brought down through Torah study, which reveals the meaning and purpose of each thing. There's seven days of creation, not ten. The three intellectual ones, it's not part of the actual creation here. Here it's saying understanding comes through Torah study. Dot, here it's saying knowing, but dot we know is the application of knowledge, is often counted as the third sphere, and keser, the crown, is not counted. In this passage, das is not counted, and keser is. There's ten attributes, and it depends on how you do things, whether or not they're going to do chachma bina das, or if it's going to be keser chachma bina. It depends on what we're focusing on, about which one is going to be brought in. Because in certain ways, das is really just a conduit. It's sometimes not necessarily described as its own attribute, because it's just the flow of what Bina has figured out to get to the mode of attributes. Keter Alyom, the supernal crown, is the Keter of Malchut, the crown of kingship, concerning which it is said, I, God, declare the end from the beginning. Keter, as in the crown, surrounds and contains the two hemisphere of the brain, Chachma and Bina, like the leather box of the tefillin that surrounds and contains the parchments. The crown is above the head, so that's what we're talking about at this level. Keter, the sphere of the crown, is the highest level of Atzils and is simultaneously the sphere of royalty of the infinite light beyond the world of Atzils, as hinted at the verse. The end of the previous world becomes the beginning of the next. Remember, that's part of the chain of creation. The bottom of one is the top of the other. This crown, which is kingship, which is going to bring Atzilus and everything else into being. On the human form, this is manifest as a skull that envelops and transcends the brain, and especially by the tefillin, which rests even beyond that. I can see why tefillin is such a big deal. It also relates to the power of will and desire, which transcend and dominate all faculties. It's also will and delight, Ratzon and Taino, that we learned last time with Atik and Arach. Within this unified system of limbs and head, which constitute one body or tree, now we're bringing a tree analogy, is the divine name spelled out with Alos. Ma, which is 
Ma, Yud as in 20, and the He, we saw it comes to 6, and Vav 13, He is 6 again, so we get 45. All this discussion of the 10 spheres is only an external description of Atsila, similar to describing a person by his physical form. That's not the real you, I'm describing external aspects of you. Describing the highest realms through the attributes is an external description of them, it's not the true essence of them. From within, however, the essence of Atsila is the divine name of four letters. Each letter spelled out, calculated to the sum of 45. We said it's the name of Ma that's bringing the light down through all of these, which is part of how they could relate to each other. With this name, you determine the way in which your light is transmitted through the spheres of Atsilas. This name therefore fills and saturates the roots and the trunk of the tree of the spheres together with its limbs and branches as water irrigates and saturates a tree. The tree then grows in proportion to how much water flows through it, as in the light that we're bringing through it is going to nurture everything. This name is the path which reveals the infinite light from its concealed state, the vital force from which extends the tree, the branches, kindness and might, chesed and gvura, and the boughs, victory and glory, netzach and hod, and is the hidden force behind all that occurs from them. Switched over from a human body metaphor to a tree metaphor. Until this point, Eliyahu was describing the world of Attilus, one step beyond creation. Now he begins discussing God's relationship with the created worlds, including our lowest of all worlds. Rebut Almit, eternal hidden master of the world. You are the supreme cause of all causes and the origin of all effects. You water the tree with that flow and that flow is the very life force of the tree, like a soul taught body, but no human likeness or bodily image exists in your infinite essence with which we might liken you to anything within or without. Despite all the descriptions that we use, there's not really any description to fully describe God or to fully contain him. Master of all realities, you are the infinite light, the origin of all. You are not a direct cause that is affected by causing, but the cause of all causes, unaffected by that which you cause. Nothing compels you to be, nothing compels you to act. You are just the one that compels everything else. The term Siba, as in like a reason, can mean something more like a catalyst that causes change, but is not change. And this aspect of you, also known as the infinite light, is the current underlying all that occurs in its heels. You are the active force behind all that occurs from that world and you sustain all that occurs. And this is a paradox, for none of this provides any glimpse of what is truly there, neither from the higher concealed world, nor from the lower revealed world. You alone created the starry galaxies and the earth from the galaxies above. You brought forth sun and moon, plants and starry constellations. On the earth below, you brought forth trees and plants, the Garden of Eden and fields of grass, living creatures, birds and fish, animals and humanity. All of creation. You created the true realms of the heavens and of the earth. Out of the heavens, you extended the sun, the moon, the stars and the formations of stars. From the earth, you extended nine other forms corresponding to the ten spheres. Out of the heavens, we have one, the two, the trees, three, the grass, four, the Garden of Eden, five, herbage, all the plants and stuff, the growing stuff, six, the wild beasts, seven animals, eight birds, nine fish and ten people. Through them, through all that exists below, you you make known that which is above, you also make known how all that is above and it's still some below, Buried Siasia, the other three worlds is regulated and how the higher worlds may be known from the lower. But knowledge of your essence is completely impossible. Without you, there is no unity in the higher or lower realms. You are therefore known as the cause of all and the master of all. So that by knowing and understanding each and all these creatures below, we will be able to know how that which is above is conducted according to that which occurs below and from both above and below. We know your greatness, yet none of this knowledge tells us what you really are. Everything, when you see the functionings of the world, you can get glimpses of what God is, but we can't understand him in his true essence. Each sphere, of course, Response to different divine name or attribute, and it is within these names that angels are called, or it is with these names that angels can be called down. You, however, beyond any name, for you are he who permeates them all, and you are he who perfects them all. Therefore, when you withhold your life from the spheres, all the names remain as empty vessels, like a body devoid of soul. Although the spheres are all expressions of the same infinite light, they are each defined and delimited by a distinct name. There are two sets of such names. One is the set of divine names, and the other is the set of names mentioned above, wisdom, understanding, etc. One are God's names, to which this is indicative of this. Abaye is Rahmim, it's the name of harmony, Elokim is Gvura. Kel is the name of kindness, etc. And the other are the names of the spheres. These names provide a way to relate to the infinite and call upon him, using different names of God according to what relationship we're trying to bring out. Similarly, when an angel is sent on a mission, it carries the name of the sphere related to that mission. For example, Gavriel is the angel of Gavura, minister of fire. When performing his mission, this angel is nothing more than the infinite light entering the world through Gavura. Yet at the same time, you have no name that describes you, nor are you affected or changed in any way by being called upon by these names. For you are the light that pervades each sphere, much as a soul fills the body. For whatever they do, it is you doing. It. So that if you should remove your light from them, the containment of the light would remain as the origin of containment precedes the origin of light, but they would be entirely inactive and impotent. There's no on switch anymore if God's light is not there to make it alive. As for you, you are intrinsically wise, but not with a noble attribute of wisdom. You understand, but without a noble attribute of understanding. No place can contain you. You clothe yourself in the spheres only in order to make your mastery and power known to human beings and to show them how the world is conducted through justice and mercy, i.e., that righteousness and judgment are meted out in perfect accord with the actions of men. So we learn about God through his actions, but we can't actually know God. Your light activates the sphere of wisdom, but you do not require the spirit to be wise, since you are the origin of wisdom. The only reason for this spirit is because wisdom within its origin is unknowable. We'd have no access to any of it without these tools. Your light activates the sphere of understanding, but you do not require it to understand, since you are the origin of understanding. The only reason for the sphere is that understanding as it is within its origin is unknowable. There's no sphere or name that defines you. Rather, the sphere would actualize your capacity for all things, that it may be recognized by cognizant beings, and to reveal how their world is directed from above through the judgment of the sphere of royalty, or malchus, and the compassionate sphere of beauty, to Paris. 
harmony, the balance of which depends on the behavior of humans who are treated measured to their deeds. So this is how you interface with the world, as we've seen. The seven lower spirit are also likened to scale, where in chesed corresponds to the right arm of the scale. Din, justice, is gur, the left arm. Mishpat, judgment, is the middle column, which is mercy, spirit. Righteousness is the holy malchut, the base of the scales. The scales of righteousness are the two pillars of truth. The measure of righteousness is the sign of the holy covenant you said. Basically, we're seeing this entire integration of the world and how everything is speaking to each other and how everything functions, how God interacts with us through all of these. So we have now learned the entire secret of the blueprint of the world. The primal origin of the judgment of the sphera of royalty, Malchus is in might, for it is for it is the place of constriction of light. But the balance of justice depends on the middle column dominated by beauty, deference, harmony. Strict judgment originates in how the sphere of royalty, Malchus, kingship, measures out righteousness when disconnected from the middle column of compassion. This is why they all need each other. Victory and splendor, endurance and acknowledgement, endurance and humility are called the two supporters of truth because they channel, weigh, and balance the justice of the sphere of beauty, Tiferous harmony, according to the state of the lower world. Foundation, Yisod, reproduction is the means by which the light of wisdom arrives in the sphere of royalty. Kingship, only that this light must be carefully measured and limited by the containment of the sphere. Of. All these together show how you conduct the world relative to man. This entire description is to say this is how God operates within the world and this is how God relates to us. But not that you yourself possess a noble quality of righteousness with which to be just, neither do you possess an attribute of judgment with which to be merciful. The same is true of all these qualities. All these qualities are how you relate to us, interact with us and the world in creation, but none of them actually define or contain you. Is the point of all of this that we just did. That is the culmination of all of it. And yet all this is not you in essence, but rather for the sake of revealing how your world is directed by you. So it's also this idea that, oh, God is some old man in the sky arbitrarily doing stuff. Like, no, no, no. There's an entire integrated, detailed, organized system through which everything is created, through which everything functions. Within your infinite light, none of these dynamics or descriptions apply. In the origin of all things, all is an absolute and immutable oneness, singular wholeness. There's no distinct realm in which righteousness becomes judgment, neither is there a distinct realm of justice, which comes to the world through beauty, which is also compassion. And so no change or division occurs within you when justice is meted out from these spheres. There's no sphere that describes you and none of them are distinct entities within you. You are not defined by any of them in any way. And here are the words of Elio. So Elio and Navi gave us a full description about how God operates in the world through these different spheres, the attributes, the tools through which he creates the world, through which he operates and through which he relates to us. But at the end of the day, none of them could fully define God, none of them could fully contain God. And all this was to say is that this entire system is brought about through this name of God that is the Miloy of Aleph of Ma. Of what? 45, which relates to Adam, which adds up to also 45. Thus we have gone through this entire description just for that one line there. Again, the essential thing is that there's a certain interrelation that comes about through all of this, specifically through this power that's being drawn down, which we have correlated to man himself. We're just in this progression of where are we going with all this and how does this ultimately get us to the whole secret of Avicis Yisrael.